Okay. Um, I'm going to make a couple of changes, if you guys don't mind. Um, just kind of some last minute changes to um, last just couple weeks. I'm trying all this weird stuff. I'm trying a weird background just for a heck of it. Um, no, but the, the couple changes I want to make is right now we are scheduled to go over um, file I/O next week and uh, operator overloading the following week. I would actually like to cover vectors today and operator overloading. Um, and next week, I might just, if it's all the same with you, I might finish up the operator overloading and do inheritance. Um, that'll give us a uh, final week. Uh, let's see here. As I think if I pull up my calendar real quick, next week is basically the last week for instruction. Um, I think Monday is too. We can call it like a review day. Um, so that that's just make sure that we we get everything kind of covered um before finals uh gives you a little bit extra time and we've already kind of gone over some file io stuff some real basic stuff um the file io chapter is a lot more in depth but i i think inheritance is a, is a more important uh topic and we'll cover that actually in more detail in upcoming classes but um it's a really good thing to kind of, you know, get your first uh, glimpse of, especially for those of you who, uh, I know we got a couple people who will be graduating um, this term. So um, unless someone has a huge um, uh, problem with that, I would like to go ahead with that uh, uh, direction if that's okay. If you do have a huge problem, you can either speak up now or you can send me an email. And, and when I check my email after this class, I'll, I'll know that you have a huge problem. But that's kind of where we're, I think we're going to go for right now. Um, so uh, last class, we talked about doing uh, some basics with templates. And we said template is a way to simplify in a lot of ways <coughs> our um, function overloading. And instead of having to define a bunch of different functions to overload based upon day types that we're going to submit to it, we can simply define a template. Uh, from that, we looked at and said, OK, well, if we can define a template for a function, then we can define a template for uh, a class. <coughs> And we just talked briefly about what a stack was. We took a look at that. Uh, if you read inside of uh, the chapter 11, uh, I think that's what it is. Um, we talk about this. Uh, they go a lot more detail on stacks. We're, we'll go into a lot more detail if you take uh, CISC uh, 210, which is being offered next term. Um, we talk about this in a lot more detail. We talk about it in some ways that uh, the book does it. We look at a couple different things. So um, it is in there. It is something that is worth looking at. But we said what was nice about being able to create a template for a whole class is <coughs> that when that class is supposed to hold some extra information for us, then we can. Uh, Instead of having to have a bunch of different classes, one for integers, one for floats, one for doubles, et cetera, we can create a generic class that works the exact same way depending upon what information you sent it. Okay, So that's where a huge advantage of this comes into place. Um, and we're going to look at a class that C++ gives us right off the bat. Um, for doing this and this is going to be make it a whole lot easier and it's called the vector class and a vector is in many ways like a uh, uh, like a array 
but it gets over a couple of the big limitations that you have that you're dealing with when you're dealing with an array. So when you're working with arrays, uh, as you probably remember, because I've made sure I've said it a bunch of different times, this is one of the things that's specific to C++ arrays compared to like a Python list, is that an array is a fixed size. And that means you have one of two problems, generally speaking. The first problem you might run into is you create an array, let's say a thousand elements, and you're only using 15 of them. So you're using up a lot of memory space because you have to define all that space in memory, whether you actually have value data in it or not. But you've got a lot of space in there in memory, and it's being wasted. Um, and that's going to affect your performance, especially if you have uh, an older computer or if you've got to have an array with a thousand elements, it probably means you're dealing with a lot of other stuff too. And now you're trying to fit all these different pieces into your memory space that you may not have room for because you've got an array taking up a huge amount of room uh, when it doesn't need to be. You might go, well, what's the odds that I'm going to have a computer that doesn't have much, you know, memory and stuff like that? Um, if you look at a lot of things, especially in a business world, a lot of times computers only get updated every three to five years. Um, and I've been in places where it's longer than that. Uh, and so that computer is just sitting there. Um, it might have been, and, and usually as an as a office type employee in a, in a regular business environment they're not buying you the latest and greatest things so you can be on the cutting edge of technology today and still have something useful in three or five years they're buying you something that will work today that meets all the requirements and then you gotta wait until you get a new computer um and so as long as you don't have something like, oh, well, the new version of Windows that came out requires eight gigs of RAM and you only have four. You're not going to go more than four. You know, you're going to go what the requirements are. Um, and so you don't, even if your application isn't huge, you can still run into issues of dealing with that memory space. Um, the second problem that you're going to run into then is you might say, well, I'm not going to take up a thousand elements because that's wasteful. I'm going to take up 20 elements, and I got my 15 elements in there. It's pretty full. I'm doing good. Then you read in some more data. You have 15 more elements, and all of a sudden, you go out of your array bounds. And it's technically called an out of bounds error. Uh, and you do see it periodically. It's where you have an array and you no longer have uh, enough elements, free elements, to put into your array. Um, so that's your, your second big problem that you can run into because C isn't going to allow you to do that. The vector, on the other hand, is designed to automatically grow as you need to apply information to it. So let's take a look at how we're going to use a vector to do that. And the key thing is going to be in the fact that we can overload a class. So if we're looking at it, we can say vector, and then we specify the data type inside of our angle brackets, and then we give it a vector name. And that data type can be ints, it can be uh, doubles, it can be strings, it could be a user-defined class like our circle. We're going to see that in just a minute. Um, so we can do anything we need to. Now, the key thing that we do need to remember before we actually go and start to implement this is we need to include an external library to make this work. It's not part of the primitive data types that you find, like, for example, with doubles and strings and stuff like that. It's a special one. We have to include its library, and it's just vector. So that's real easy to do. And if I come here to my simple tool, You'll notice that here I'm included vector, okay? So let's take a look real quick at what it would look like to add a vector of, let's say, integers, okay? So I'm going to come in and give it my key term vector, 
and then I'm going to put inside of it int. So I have to let it know that what my data type is. If I leave off the int, if I just say vector v, your notice is it's going to give me an error, and that's because as vector is a uh, template class, if we don't tell it a data type, it doesn't know what to do. So get the data type v and i'm going to call this n okay so i now have a vector of integers <clears throat> do i have any data in it no how big is it not big let's take a quick look um there is a special class or a special method if i say vn dot size And I go and I run this real quick. <clears throat> You're going to notice that by default, if you can see up here, it's given me a default size of zero. And that's how big it is. That's all the space I get, zero. So I don't have a lot of space inside my vector. Uh, now, I can add it. And if I, as soon as I go in and add a va an item, it's going to increase its size. How much? That depends upon how they decide to write vector and implement it. Um, I might, you know, if it's really small, I might add one at a time. If I'm dealing with uh, 100 items, I might add 10 at a time. Uh, so, you know, about 10%. If I'm dealing with 1,000, I might say, you know, oh, I'm still only going to add 10 at a time. Um, depending upon how it's implemented internally, uh, there's a lot of different reasons for doing it different ways. Uh, small increments of adding a, a, a number of elements to my vector means that I'm not going to take up any more space than I need. I'm not going to have a bunch of wasted space. On the flip side, um, I might have a situation where uh, if every time that I add an element, so I might add one at a time, but that's a, there's a performance hit to that. Is every time it has to recalculate, it has to to set up you know new memory space, it has to copy stuff over, and that becomes troublesome. So how I'm going to add elements to a vector is very dependent upon uh, the rules that the class is defined. Um, and we don't know that because we don't have access to that source code directly. Uh, and so whether it's a percentage of how much is there or it's a fixed number, we just don't know at this point. Um, now, let me give you another quick uh, comment. And this comes into when I start thinking about how am I going to build stuff myself. Uh, so I graduated from UCF, and UCF is a very large school. When I went there, it was the second largest school in the state of Florida, had about 28,000 people in it. Uh, now it's, I think, the second or third largest in the U.S. and has close to 60,000 students, okay, um, to give you an idea of how big that school is. Most of the classes had a up to about 30, 35 students was how big a classroom was. If you went past that, the next most common size was about 250. And so if I was writing a specialized vector class, for example, and I wanted to go in and specify how big was this and how big could it grow and, and stuff like that, what I would do, and, and this is just, you know, me as a developer thinking about because I want to cut down the number of times we're going to add elements to an item. I might start it with initial value of, let's say, 35. And then every time I need to add someone, I'm going to add maybe 100 or, or 200 people to it because that's the next most common size for my classrooms at 250. Um, I do have some classrooms at UCF, at least when I was there, uh, that had about 70 to 100 students. So I might say, okay, we'll do it by hundreds. That way, you know, if you're not in a class of 30, you're going to be in a class of 100. If you're not in a class of 100, you're going to be in 250. So I might have to add two more implementations. Um, 
And once I get to 250, uh, at least when I was there, your next most common size was about 400 students in a class. So you could make some big jumps, but if you did it by 100, you weren't making a whole bunch of jumps. Um, if I did it by 250, I wouldn't make as many, but I might have some wasted space. And there's always those trade-offs that I have to think about when I'm building something. Now, the vector class inside C++ by default uh, starts off with a size of zero, and it just, you know, works with you. Uh, you can give it an initial size, though, of how many you want to see. So if I come down here and say vector double, for example, um, actually, let me start with strings. Sorry. Do a vector string, and I'm going to say VSDR. And do an open parenthesis, and I'm going to say 10. And what that's going to do is that's going to give me 10 starting elements. So in a vector, I can create a starting element based upon some assumptions that I'm going to have, and I'm going to think about. Uh, I'm, I might think about, oh, I, I know I'm going to have you know 10 at a time, or um, for uh, class size at, at Tusculum, you know. We usually go by tens, and you know I don't think you guys have many classes that have more than uh, 30 or 40 students in it, so it's not that big a deal to go that uh, big. Um, I don't have the ability, though, to determine my jump size. That has to be defined by whoever implemented this class inside of C++. If I go in and just out of curiosity, vstr.size, How many people think that it's going to be just, you can use a little reaction, you know, hand raise thing or clap or whatever it is. Uh, how many people think that my size is going to come back as 10 since I'm giving it a starting, you know, initialization size as 10? Or how many are going to think that it's going to be zero because I've not put any data in it? So if you think it's going to be 10 because that's where I started with, use like the, the hand raise one. Or not hand raise, uh, the clap one, you don't have a hand raise, you have a clap. No one? Okay. How many people think it's going to start with zero because I haven't put any data in it? So I've reserved the elements, but no data. I got one thing saying yes, two, three. Okay. So let's take a quick look and try us out. Um, so this is a great way to try things out and, and see. Um, I always love to try things out because that's the way we learn. All right. So come up. The first one is zero because we didn't define anything. The second one, we define the size as having 10 elements, and it's showing the size as 10. So even though those elements are empty and we're not doing anything with them, they do show up. So that is an important thing to just kind of – let you know about. Um, do keep that in mind if you would. All right. Let's look at the next thing I want to show you with vectors, and that is I can give it a default value. So I'm going to create a vector of doubles. DBL. And if I pass in two parameters, the first one is going to be um, the size, my initial size. The second one is going to be uh, my default value. So if I say 5 and then 2.17, no, let's do 2.71, 2.71, And where this becomes beneficial, and just to give you an example of how this is going to be used, because a vector is a class and it has a little bit more information to it, remember with an array, we, a lot of times if we pass an array to a function, we had to ourselves keep track of how big that array was. And often we pass in a second parameter to say, oh, this is an array of size, or you'd use a global constant to define the size. Well, if I write a for loop here, uh, 
I can do some like get the size. And by getting the size, I can now loop through this and it says, hey, this is how big I'm supposed to be. Now, the other thing this is going to let me do, and I'm just going to show you real quick, I have two different ways that I can access the elements of my vector. So I can say VDBL, and I can specify with my square brackets, just like I do with an array. So very, very familiar. I'll put a little tab character in there. Or I can say VDBL dot at I. So if you remember, that was how we could get the letter of a specific letter of a string was with the at method. Um, and those two are actually synonymous. They do the exact same thing. Uh, and what we're going to see is, in, in just a little bit, we're going to look at how we're able to do that with the brackets. And that's through a process called uh, operator overloading. So it's very similar to function overloading. We're not going to worry about it at this point. We're just going to run through this example. So I went and got my size initially, didn't set any values at zero. Second one, I set initial size of 10, got that. Third one, a set of doubles, a vector of doubles. I've set that to five, a default value of five, or excuse me, a default um, size of five, and default value of 2.71. And 2.71 is printed out because I have in here my for loop that I've specified. I'm using my for loop to try both my square brackets and my at method. I'm also using the size method within my for loop so I know how far I should go inside of my for loop. Um, the other things that you're probably going to notice right off the bat or you should start to notice is that because I said int i equals zero, vectors just like arrays are zero based indexed. So, important thing to kind of keep track of, it is a zero base indexing. The second thing you're probably noticing is that uh, with size, it's going to make it a whole lot easier because now I don't have to pass the extra parameters. I know how big it is. How do I know? I've got that method right there for me. Uh, now, remember, as in this example, there's still 10 elements in here. They're just not being used because I didn't give it a value. So this is how big my vector is. Doesn't mean all that data elements are used. So it's not perfect. Now I do want to implement, you know, I do want to be very clear on that, but it does work. <clears throat> okay. Um, so you can hopefully see some similarities and some differences with arrays. Um, what we've not seen is what happens if we want to add an element to our, our uh, vector. So if we look over here, we come back over here real quick. Um, there is a whole bunch of vector functions that are provided for us. Uh, the biggest ones we're going to be concerned about is this pushback and popback. And what those do is those add elements to our vector. Specifically, they add them at the end. So if we start here and say element 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then we're going to, if we add a new one with pushback, it gets added here after it. Um, we can't insert something in the middle. We can't take it, spread it apart, put one in the middle. I can't add it to the front. I'm looking solely at putting elements in the back. Um, Pop back is going to remove the last item. So keep that in mind. Um, and then we have two others which are kind of interesting. One is empty, and this just lets us know if it's actually uh, been empty or not. And the second is clear, which is going to delete all the elements out of my vector. So two other important things to kind of 
you know, keep track of. So let's look at how we're going to use that push back. So I'm going to take V double push back, and then I need to push back something that I can store. You'll notice it comes up and it tells me what I can look at. Okay. Uh, I am going to just give it a value, 3.14. We should all recognize that one. And a little copy paste magic here. Okay. So let's see if this is what this is going to do for us. Rerun it. Uh, you know what? Hold on. Let me make this a little more clear. I want to see, put a couple of blank lines there just so we can see where our loops begin and end. Okay. So here's our initial loop, 2.17. There's one, two, three, four, five elements, just like we expect. Here's our second loop, 2.71, one, two, three, four, five times. And then our sixth time is our new element, 3.14. So notice it went to the end just as we expected. Okay, the size automatically get up, got updated. That's a huge advantage to our, uh, to our vector class. In fact, if we came over here and we said, hey, what size is our vector class? After we do our push. Notice it came up and gives it a value of six. So it's not creating wasted space at this point, uh, probably because it's pretty small and we're not doing this a lot. If we do this more often and we have a lot more data, that might be a different thing. We say, hey, I've got to add 15 elements. It might go away and say, I'm doing this 15 times. I'm bigger. Instead of adding one, let's add three at a time, two at a time, 10 at a time. It's up to that's own implementation. Like I said, we don't have access to that. We don't know how complicated that is. Um, there's always trade-offs in how complicated you get stuff. Okay. <clears throat> Let me go ahead and I'm just going to kind of clear this out real quick. And I want to create a vector of circle. So if I go and I'm just going to build this, you're going to notice that it works just the same. So remember, string is a class. It's a, it's a class type. Circle is a class that we've defined. So this is going to work the same, um, exactly the same, whether I'm using primitive data types or I'm using classes. So Remember I talked about before, if I was doing class registration uh, at UCF or, or I could do it anywhere, um, now I can hold easily uh, a number of students and just add to them as I need. That way I get more um, data. I'm not just getting student numbers. I'm not just getting a student name. I, I could put in a whole student class of names and majors and all that type of stuff. And when we get reports as instructors, and you've probably not seen these because you're not an instructor, um, we get all that type of information with you guys. Um, we get things like email address and phone number if we, there's ones available. That way we can reach out and contact you if we need to. We get information on if you're uh, in a sport and what sport it is. Um, because sometimes we need to contact uh, a coach and stuff like that. Uh, we're going to be making some changes um, for, uh, I believe it's fall term. Uh, that we just found out about yesterday. Uh, one of the things we're going to get is your advisor. So if we need to reach out to your advisor and, and or if the advisor wants to reach out to us, vice versa, they can pull up a list of all the classes with all the instructors that you guys have. And they find out who's the instructor and how to get a hold of them, you know, what are uh, 
uh, extension number is and what our email is and stuff like that. So that way we, we have access, <clears throat> easier access to a lot more information. And that's a real key thing when you're working with systems that you're trying to interact with people. So that in a nutshell is the vector class. Um, is there any questions that you guys have about the vector class that you will want to ask or see real quick? Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to assume that to be no. Let's move on then to, that's not what I need. Let's move on then to operator overloading. And operator overloading is kind of an interesting thing. Um, it's interesting because a lot of languages do not allow you to do this. Um, and this is a real problem, in, in my opinion. So I'm gonna delete this stuff real quick and I'm gonna create two objects. C1 and circle C2 and I'll give it a default radius. Okay, I have these two circle objects. And let's say I want to write a little if statement. If C1 is greater than C2, oops, Okay. All right. So I want to determine which one's bigger. I've got a CL statement to help me kind of define which one's bigger. Um, but notice I've got an error. You might be able to see it on your screen. It's got a little kind of underlined squiggly error. If I come here and I say build, <coughs> you'll notice it gives an error. No operator greater than symbol matches these operands. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that my greater than symbol, it has rules for it that let it define how to determine if an integer is bigger than another integer or if. Um, a double is greater than another double. It knows how to calculate that. But how does it look at C1 and C2? How does it know which is bigger? Does it look at the memory address where those objects are stored? I mean, I could. That's not very beneficial to me, but I could. Um, does it look for how much memory space is being taken up? In theory, it should be the same uh, memory space. You know, we're dealing with a pretty simple class. And there's not a lot of, you know, things that are going to be variable in size, uh, like string objects and stuff like that. That's not involved. So that's not going to work because everything would show up exactly the same. So how does it determine what's bigger? You might say, well, you know, obviously it should look at its radius because, duh, but what's very obvious to us is not going to be obvious to the computer because how does it know that that's the property or a set of properties that need to be defined? And the answer is it doesn't. It needs to be able to have a way to, to figure this out. And so that's what we call operator overloading. Okay, so this is what we refer to as operator overloading. And operator overloading is just the basic way of how do we specify I have um, one of the standard operators of C++ that I want to use and I want to make it be able to work with my class. So 
I gave you some some pretty common ones that you can use uh, that are shown. There's actually more if you look at table 14.1 inside the book. But you know, how do I want to add two of them together, or subtract two, uh, or divide two, or find out greater than or less than or equal to, or any of those types of things? Um, the the conditional operators are pretty common to do: um, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. A little less so. Some of the others are even less so. Um, so I, that's why I didn't list all of them. Uh, it just kind of depends upon what you're trying to do. Um, in fact, this is done for us in other classes, and we've used this without even knowing it. Uh, if you remember when we talked about C style strings, with a C style string, you had to specifically define that um, and use like string compare to determine if two strings were less than or greater than another or equal. String compare would return a number for you. Um, but with a string, we can simply use a greater than or less than symbol. So if I come here real quick and I'm just going to temporarily comment these out. I've got two strings here. And I can do C out S2 plus S1 and Dell. And I can do a C out of S1 greater than S2. Now, I am going to show you one little issue that you're going to have with this. Um, if I go and build this solution real quick, it sees S1 being sent to C out, and then it sees the greater than symbol, and it gets confused. Whenever you see something like that, because it doesn't know what to do, and it, it shows the error on the second uh, output op operator. Um, all you have to do is take it and put those inside of parentheses. And now when I go build this, I get LA Cali and I get zero, zero being uh, for faults um, for my Boolean operator. Okay. <clears throat> so that's an example of us, of it being done for us already with strings. So how do we make it work for a circle? Well, the good news is it's pretty simple as well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to define an output operator Boolean. I have to actually specify operator and then the symbol that I'm using for my operator. And then I define a second circle. And this is going to get defined inside of my header. Just like that. And if I wanted, I could come back here and do a greater than symbol as well. That way I can check both. Generally, if I'm going to check for one, e one equality or inequality, I want to check for all six. Okay, um, I'm just going to do the two here for simplicity's sake. Now, if you notice it has a couple of little um, issues here, it's just because it says, hey, I can't find the function definition. We've got the function prototype, but not the definition. If I build this, Notice it will build. It comes down here at the bottom. It says build. One succeeded. This is one of those warnings. And remember, C++ will allow you to have a certain number of warnings. All right. So I'm going to come in here. Bool. Circle. Operator less than. Circle C. Okay. So this is going to be my less than operator. <clears throat> I'm going to say return. And this is going to be a little bit of a shortcut. Now I'll let you see what we're going to do and kind of talk about this. So um, let me show you real quick <clears throat> the long way of doing this. So I, the long way would be I'm going to create a Boolean uh, variable. And I'm going to return that Boolean variable. And I'll say 
<clears throat> something like if C, uh, or sorry, if radius is less than C dot get radius, answer equals true, else answer equals false. Okay, so a, a real simple way of, of doing that check. Um, yeah, you're probably going to say, well, that's a little complicated. I, I could come up with something simpler, and I think you should be able to. Um, you might say, well, I would say answer equals false, give it a default value, and then if it's true, we'll set the answer to true, return answer and that works that is simpler you are absolutely correct that is simpler but let's come down here and show you a simpler way circle operator greater than and i'm going to go straight to the return you might say, why would I go straight to return? That's a very good question. So if we look up here, we have if, and then we have a condition. And we're checking to see a property of the class that I'm in right now against the same property in the class that was passed in. Well, I could easily come in and say radius greater than c dot get radius and what this is going to do is it's going to return a value for me it automatically returns the value for me um, so instead of having to check inside a condition and the condition returns a true false value and then we go in and do something with it we're just going to go in straight and say here's a condition what value comes out of checking that condition and let's return that value so I don't have to create extra variables, local variables. I don't have to run any type of checks, um, and I don't have to return something. The checking and returning is all in one step. So where I have, a, in this example, I have a minimum of three steps, a maximum of four. In this one, I have two. The first one would be creating a variable. Second would be checking our condition. Third possible is to update the variable, and fourth is to return it. Here I check the condition for one and return it for two. If I build this here, uh, oops, forgot my parentheses. If I build this now, but I don't have my syntax error, notice it works just fine for me. Okay, so if we come back here to our C++, now <clears throat> if we look at our, our code over here next to our output, we create our two circles, C1 and C2. We say if C1 is greater than C2, we're going to print out C1 is bigger, else we're going to print out C2 is bigger. It now, because we've created this function overload, it now knows that how to compare those two objects. Notice I didn't have to say C1 dot operator greater than C2. I could. I actually could. I don't have to, though. Why? This feels more normal. That greater than symbol is just how I'm used to coding. It's going to be less typing to do. It's going to be more consistent with how I do my coding. And that's what I'm looking for. That's why we have operator overloading in C++. Because I could have, if I wanted to, and, and other languages require, I could have had to specify um, a special function and call that function. And then it'd be like C1 dot 
is greater than, and then pass in C2 to it. That's just, it, it, it's not easy to use. This, I think everyone can agree, is just a lot more consistent and easy to use. I'm used to doing it this way. I know how to do it this way. Why would I change it? Not only that, and just to make sure this does work, if I go in and make my radius 0.5 and run this, C1 should be bigger. And it is, and it specifies as such right here. So regardless of which way it came back, I always like to double check. Um, and when you start learning about something called unit test, uh, one of the things that you'll see is that if I'm looking at, at like a condition, I wanna check for where condition is gonna be true, and I'm gonna check for where condition is gonna be false. I need to always do that check to make sure that I'm always doing, thing, doing things correctly. So that's just real quick how I could do function overloading to make my code work the way I expect it to, the way I want it to. So it uh, becomes really advantageous, has a lot of benefits for us. Uh, and like I said, we could, we could create all those other ones. Now, that does not mean that we have to. So if we look at all these, we might say, well, wait a second, I don't need to do uh, – you know, the up angle or the uh, percent sign or any of this. Other I don't need to do those. You're right. Um, you only do the ones that you need to. Uh, so if I were to have like two circles, how do I add two circles together? Or how do I subtract a circle from another? Um, th there's not really a way to do that unless I get a lot more complicated with how my data works. So if there's something that doesn't make sense, I'm going to not do that function overload. I don't need to ever divide two circles with one with another. That's kind of foolishness. Um, so I'm not going to go about the business of creating that function. Um, I'm only going to do the ones that I, I know I'm going to need. Now, typically, like I said, if I'm going to do one conditional check, I'm going to do all six. Uh, so that's less than, less than or equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to, equal to and not equal to, those are your six. So typically if I do one, I'll do all six, um, but a lot of times I don't even need to do those in all honesty. Uh, if, and give you a good example, one that we had just talked about, if I had a class of students, how would I define that a student is greater than another student? You know, that's kind of crazy, you know, um, if anytime I would need to do something like that, I would have to be very specific and not necessarily the same way. Uh, so, for example, I might need to sort students by name. Well, that's one way of looking at greater than or less than, right? But I also might want to sort students by GPA. Well, that's another type of greater than or less than, but not what I'm looking for. <clears throat> so, there's a lot of, of potential confusion with that, so I wouldn't put those type of operators in. Um, I would have specialized functions or methods for dealing with those specialized circumstances. And that's always the thing to keep in mind, too, is sometimes I, I can't do something as simple as an operator for that. So a lot of it comes into what am I going to do, how am I going to do it, and how can I progress more so forward. All right, that is what I have for today. We've got about 20 minutes left. Uh, what I would like to do is um, I want to open up the floor to see if you guys have any questions with the homework. Uh, I know that in some cases uh, it's, it's a little bit more challenging. I know so you guys have told me as much. Um, because you can't, a little bit more difficult to follow along and or it's a little bit more difficult to, um, you know, come to an office hour type thing. So since you are here and you guys have made the, the time for that, I do want to uh, open this up for questions. <clears throat> Any questions you guys might have about the homework that was due today um, or if you guys have.